Looking at our world from a theological perspective, this is the Theology Central Podcast, making Theology Central. Good evening, everyone. It is Wednesday, December the 21st, 2022. It is currently 8.59 p.m. Central Time, and I'm coming to you live from the Theology Central studio located right here in Abilene, Texas. And if I'm going to be honest with you, I'm not very excited. And I know I'm supposed to be very excited because, well, this is the last message in this kind of a mini-series. It's not really a mini-series because it's a part of a longer series, but this mini-series within a larger series on basically answering the charge of antinomianism. We've been reviewing a sermon where someone is answering the charge of antinomianism, and this is the last one. So when you reach that last one, and you're like, okay, I've been working on this. This has turned into four parts. When you get to the conclusion, you want the conclusion to be dramatic. You want the conclusion to be what everyone remembers. You want the the conclusion to be somewhat satisfying, right? You want the conclusion to be like, wow, that was great. That was wonderful. But I, I, I'm not excited because I feel like the conclusion here is going to be such a letdown, so frustrating, so irritating. And the end result is all we're hearing is the same old thing. I, I, this, this is nothing different than what we hear everywhere. It's so bizarre that this pastor's preaching a sermon supposedly answering the charge of antinomianism by basically just giving, well, what everyone already thinks and believes in the majority of evangelicalism. And, and it's so, Oh, it's it's so frustrating. It's so frustrating. And I guess I've grown, I guess over the last couple of months, I've grown more and more tired. And and, and you heard this in our in the last episode I did in our series on hindering the presence of God. And in fact, I kind of lost the plot in that series because I started talking about this, but that's okay. I I've I've kind of reached a point of just total exhaustion. I'm just, I'm just totally tired of it because, and what I, what I'm tired of, what I'm exhausted by is the never ending Christian doublespeak. It's just, we say one thing and then we say the opposite thing. And then somehow we think in our minds, these completely contradictory ideas make sense together when they don't. And anyone listening, you're like, that that doesn't make any... If you're saying this, this should be the logical conclusion. But then you don't take it to its logical conclusion. You offer something completely contradictory to what you originally said, and it's maddening, and it never stops. And whenever you try to point it out, then you're the one who they point the finger at, and you're the one who's accused, and, all, and, they, and you get the accusation placed at you, and all you're like, all I'm trying to do is say, hey, Christians... Let's think what we're saying. Let's think about what we're saying and take it to its logical conclusion. And then we have to deal with the difficulty that leads us to. But for some weird reason, Christians don't like that. So in this particular case, in this particular case, and again, if you go back and listen, I could re- recite all of the things we talked about in the, that cr- the crazy series about hindering the presence of God. I mean, that or his uh, hindering the presence of Christ. It's just, it's just insane. He's present, but he's not present. But there's another kind of presence. And I get that presence if I absolutely surrender, which seems to say I can absolutely surrender. But if I don't absolutely surrender, then I don't get this presence. And if I don't have this presence, then I don't have this power. But I do have power, but I can lose the power. It's just, it's just, it's just circular reasoning. It's just nonsense. It's just Christians use words and never, I guess, I guess within Christianity, it's not if the words have any actual, like they actually mean anything. They just have to sound good. They just got to sound super spirit. If you say super spiritual sounding words, no one's going to stop and go, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Let me think this through. Okay, wait a minute. If you're saying this, then this should be the, okay, wait, wait, wait. I got a problem. No, 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 no. Look, look, don't think about what I'm saying hear how spiritual it sounds, right? Just give me an amen. And then if you're in a church that does it, (laughs) applaud and say, pastor, that was wonderful. Oh, I felt God was speaking to me. 
Okay. I have no clue what it actually means, but it sounded spiritual. Okay. But I'm sorry. I can't do that. I've never been able to do that. I've always like, well, wait a minute. If we say this, I don't understand. And it's always like, you just don't get it. I'm always told I don't get it, but I'm never told what I don't get. Okay. So let's try to work through this. All right. Within the evangelical world, within the evangelical world, Christianity is presented something like this. We're saved by grace alone, through faith alone, because of Christ alone. We are saved by an imputed righteousness. And everyone seems to love that. Everyone says, amen. But we usually say that it seems relatively quick and immediately we move from the imputed righteousness to something else. It goes like this. You're saved by grace alone, through faith alone, because of Christ alone. You're saved by an imputed righteousness. His righteousness and his obedience is imputed to your account. And then almost immediately. But, however, if you don't do A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, M, N, O, P, Q, R, S, T, U, V, W, X, Y, and Z twice, if you don't do these things, you prove you were never saved. And then you're like, well, wait, 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 wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. If the righteousness was imputed, how can my actions prove imputed righteousness? If it's imputed, you can't test me. You have to test the righteousness that was imputed to me, which is perfect. So whatever test you come up with, which is basically going to come from the law, it's going to come from scripture that is law, you're going to give me this law test. Well, guess what? The only thing that can pass the law test is perfect righteousness. So what? testing me, it doesn't make any sense. It doesn't change anything. I'm going to repeat the analogy that I've been giving given now for a couple of weeks. Again, if, I, if I'm in math class and I have failed every math test for an entire year, zero, 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 the teacher declares before the whole class that this, this guy right there, right here, there, that the host of the Theology Central podcast, he is the worst, worst math, math student in the history of math. He is horrible. He is foolish. He is dumb. He is ignorant. He doesn't know anything. He's never going to pass math. He is the worst ever. All right. Now, that would be true because I failed all the tests. It would be true that I'm the worst ever. It would be true that I'm never going to accomplish anything because I don't, I'm, I'm horrible at math and I failed all the tests. But wait, all of a sudden someone stands up and says, wait, 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 wait. I'll take all of his failing grades. You can attribute them to me right? You can attribute all my failing grades to me. You can say that you failed, that you're, that you are a horrible math student. I will take it upon me, but I will give to him all of my perfect scores. I will give him all of my academic achievements in math. They will all be his. I've never missed a math test in my entire, uh, missed a question on a math test in my entire, they're all his. Now let's say the teacher's like, okay, I'm going to accept your math And I'm going to impute that to him. I'm going to give it to his account. So at that moment, before that teacher, guess what? I'm now the best math math student in the history of mankind. I am the greatest math student ever. I have nothing but A's. It's been imputed to me. And all of my failure has been given to someone else. So I stand now the perfect math student, never failed, never missed a question. And that is all true positionally. That's all true in a positional way, because it's been imputed to me. Now, at that moment, if anyone was to walk up to me and say, here's a math test, here it is, take it. Guess what's going to happen? I'm going to fail, and I'm going to fail, and I'm going because the imputed math scores does not make me a math student, doesn't improve my math skills. I'm still the same broken math student. So given me the test, it's still going to prove failure, 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 failure. You can say, see, you're a failure. And I will say, yes, look at that. I failed. Look, I failed. I failed the math test. Look, 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 I failed. Look, 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 I failed. And I'll be, you're absolutely right. And I'll say, but one second, one second. I would take that test, in a sense, hand it to the teacher. And the teacher would hand it back and say, I'm sorry, 
Uh, he did not fail this. He gets an A. He got everyone right. And you'd be like, no, 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 no. He's still a failure. No, because now all the, the perfect math score is imputed to him. So he can't fail the test. So if you really want to test him, you've got to test the perfect righteousness that was given to him. You've got to test the perfect math score that was given to him. And it's always going to be perfect. So I can't fail. Now, for some weird reason, Christians have a hard time with this. We say, you're, we say we're saved by an imputed righteousness, but immediately we want, to, we want to say, but however, you've got to do these things to prove it. My actions can't prove an imputed righteousness. It could only prove and infused righteousness, which is Roman Catholicism. I don't know why it's so complicated. So here's what we do. So on one hand, we say we, we are saved by an imputed righteousness, and then we demand that practical righteousness to some level, we can't really determine exactly how many of these you have to pass or how you have to pass them, but some level of, an, of practical righteousness must manifest itself to prove that I receive the imputed righteousness, which is a contradiction in terms completely. Imputed righteousness, you don't test me, you test the righteousness that's been accredited to my account, which is perfect. So already we have a contradiction, but then it gets even more confusing and, and the Christian doublespeak. These people who say you must have a practical righteousness will say the reason you can have that practical righteousness is because you've now been given the power to obey. You now can obey, obey the law of God. You now can say yes to God, no to sin, because you have a new heart. It's almost, they come very close to basically saying that the old nature is eradicated. They basically say you have, you have a new heart, new spirit. Uh, every, uh, everything now is new. You are a new creature in Christ, old and passed away. They say that is true practically. They say all of this. They, they hype it up. You have the power. You can now obey. You now walk in the power of the spirit. You can do it. You've been set free from the bondage of sin. You've been set free from the power of sin. And everyone in the church is say, amen, amen. And then after saying all of that, it will be, but however, you're still going to sin and you can't be perfect. All right, so let me get this right. I'm saved by an imputed righteousness, but I have to prove that I'm saved by an imputed righteousness by what I do. And if I don't do it, I'm not saved. But you're not saved by works, but you have to have the works in order to prove you're saved, even though you're supposedly saved by an imputed righteousness. And the reason you can perform this practical righteousness to a satisfactory level, they never tell us what that sat satisfactory level actually is, if you, if you, you, you can perform it because see now you've been given the power. You can do this and you can do this. However, supposedly there's a limit to the power. So I can do it, but I can't really do it. Like you've been set free from sin, but you're still going to sin. I don't know how I'm set free. You've been set free from sin, but you can't be perfect. So I'm saved by imputed, but I have to have practical to prove the imputed. I can do it, but I really can't do it. I'm set free, but I'm not really free because I can't be perfect. All right, you're good to go, right? It's just this double speak all day long. One contradiction after another contradiction after another contradiction after another contradiction. On one hand, they would have to, the way they argue, perfect Christians should not only be possible, should be probable. It's just maddening. Now, I say all of that, 13 minutes. Because that's where I'm just, I'm just, I don't know what to say anymore to Christians. It's just, it's just nonsense. They just say these words and nobody wants to go, wait a minute, what am I saying? This doesn't even make sense to me. Here are the facts. We're saved by an imputed righteousness apart from works. That righteousness has been given to me by faith alone, apart from works. That is how I'm saved. That is how, and I cannot test that because it's imputed. And if you do want to test it, you have to well, test the one who gave me the righteousness, which is Jesus Christ. You'll discover that my righteousness passed every, will pass every test because it's perfect. So first we've got, that, that's number one. We've got to understand the imputed righteous, righteousness concept versus the infused, which is what the entire Protestant Reformation was about. Number two. No matter what you claim, no matter how much power you claim Christians have, no matter how much you want to claim Christians have been set free, no matter what you claim, 
The reality is we sin 24 hours a day, seven days a week in some way, shape, or form. We sin in thought, word, and deed. We sin in our motivations. We sin in our actions, the actions we do and the actions we fail to do. I can give you the basic test. You know what I'm going to give you. Do you love the Lord that God with all your heart, mind, body, and soul? No, you never do. Do you love your neighbor as yourself? Don't even pretend. And God says in the Old Testament and the New Testament Testament to be as holy as he is holy. You have not never put, put, pulled that off one day, meaning you're living in perpetual sin. And to say otherwise is a lie. Those are basic facts. Now, someone sent me a sermon that supposedly finds a solution to the law gospel distinction. And I will once again say we don't need to solve the distinction. We must maintain the distinction. According to them, hey, if you preach that we are saved by an imputed, if we preach that we are saved by an imputed righteousness, someone will accuse us of uh, antinomianism. And that is true. If you really emphasize that we're saved by an imputed righteousness, if you really preach that, you will be accused of antinomianism. In fact, you've never truly preached the gospel until you are accused of antinomianism. If you've never been accused of antinomianism, you've never preached the gospel. Once you're accused of antinomianism, you can say, I've preached the gospel finally correctly. And and I completely agree with that point of the sermon that we've been reviewing. But here's what they do. Okay, you've accused us of antinomianism. Now let us fix the problem so that you know we're not antinomian. And their solution is not the imputed righteousness of Christ. No, their supposed solution to this is Hey, in Ezekiel, which is a passage directly spoken to Israel about Israel, literally saying, it literally says you're going to be regathered, you know, gathered back to the land. They, they rip it out of its context, make it about us. So according to them, in salvation, every person who has been saved, the old heart is removed. We get a new heart and we get a new spirit. Now he didn't qualify exactly what that means, but it sounds very close like the removal of the old nature and all we have is a new nature. He then says, the text says that God will cause us definitive action. It will occur that now we will obey his statutes and walk or obey his judgments and walk in his statutes or or obey his statutes and walk in his judgments. I don't remember the exact wording, but there's a paraphrase. And he says that will happen to every Christian. So here's the thing. Hey, we're not antinomians because even though we teach that you're saved by an imputed righteousness, Dun, dun, da, da. The reality is we're saved by an imputed righteousness, but because of regeneration, we will no longer live in sin. We will stop sinning. And he doesn't say, he, he basically makes it sound like we can be sinless. Hey, we can obey. We've been set free. We now have the power. We can do this. We won't live in sin any longer. We will no longer live for self. We will now hunger and thirst after right, righteousness. We will now pursue God. And he makes it sound like we will do all of these things. Because now we can. So his argument to the charge of antinomianism is to basically say, don't focus on the imputed righteousness. Let's focus on all of this other things that supposedly we can do. But he never, at this point in the sermon, he's yet to acknowledge, well, wait a minute. We really can't do this or this or that. We really can't do this right. We're going to fall short of, he's not acknowledged. He's yet to acknowledge the fact that all this supposed power we have clearly never manifests itself because Christians have been sinning for 2000 years and they continue to sin and we fail God and thought, word, and deed. And if we're guilty at one point of the law, we're guilty of all of it. And nobody has ever sought first the kingdom of God. Nobody, all the things that we're supposed to do, we fall short of. He actually went to the Sermon on the Mount, basically saying we can obey it instead of seeing it as law, which condemns us and shows that we can't. So his, 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 his solution is, hey, you now can do it. You can now keep the law. You can do it. <laughs> and it's maddening. Now, so, so in some ways, I, don't, I just want to stop the review, but I'm going to finish it up. I'm going to finish it up. He, he's right now in the sermon. He's in the midst of saying, you can do this. You can do this. You can do this. You have the power to do this. You have the power. You can, you can, you can, you can, you can, you can. 
Dun, 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 dun. So really, salvation is not about an imputed righteousness. It's about an infused righteousness that now gives you the, ob- the ability to obey. It is a little bit maddening. And again, more doublespeak. Say this. The next thing you know, say something else that seems to contradict what you said. Or it's kind of a bait and switch, right? I'm going to, here's the bait. And as soon as you reach out for the bait, switch. <laughs> and you're like, wait, what just happened? What just happened? What just happened? Hey, you want to be saved? Just believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. He died for your sins. Believe on him and his righteousness will be accredited to your account and you will be saved. Oh yes, I'm a sinner. I know I'm a sinner. I'm never going to be able to obey all of those laws. I want salvation. And as soon as you reach out, switch, but you better do A, B, C, D, E, F, G. And if you don't do all of these things, then you are never saved. Well, wait a minute. I thought I was saved by grace alone through faith. No, 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 no. That's just the marketing campaign. We tell you you're saved by grace alone through faith alone because of Christ alone. But as soon as you get saved, we make sure you realize really quick, huh, you didn't read the fine print. No, no, no. You're not saved by that alone. You Because if you really are saved, you will do all of these things. So you better get busy doing all of these things to prove to us that you're actually saved, or we're going to tell you that you're not saved. And then that you're going to go to hell. Okay, so actually, even though we say you're not saved by works, you have to do the works because if you don't do the works, you were never saved, meaning you have to do them in order to be saved. Oh, okay, never mind. And then at some point, you just say, you know what? Just forget all of this. So he's right now in this part of the sermon where he's hyping up all the things we can do because he applied Ezekiel to us, which is actually applied to Israel, which is speaking of some future time where Israel will be regathered. They will get the land and they will be regenerated, and God will give them a new heart, and all of Israel will be saved, and they will obey. But that's not yet to happen, and that's not going to happen until, I guess, the only place we could put that in any system of eschatology, I think Christ is going to have to be on the earth. Maybe millennial kingdom, maybe? I don't know. And you say, oh, 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 yeah. look, the text says Israel is going to be regathered They're going to be restored. They're going to be regenerated and they're going to obey. That's never happened in history. And don't make, don't, don't take that text and say that's the church because that's the most ludicrous ludicrous thing in the world because the text literally says you're going to get the land. So it's just a matter of how you do hermeneutics. All right, but here we go. Let's finish this. That's 22 minutes of trying to help you see the double speak, the double talk. And trust me, it's happening in your church. Trust me, it's happening in your Sunday school class. Trust me, it happens in our own lives because we've all been guilty of it. Let's see if he gets past the double speak and we'll get down to the very nitty gritty of it, right? As what J. Vernon McGee used to say, I'm going to put the cookies on the bottom shelf where everyone can get to them. He needs to take the cookies and put them on, on the bottom shelf so that we know exactly what it means. Okay, I can do it, but can I do it perfectly? And if I don't do it perfectly... Does that mean I'm not saved? And why am I looking to practical action to prove imputed righteousness? Inquiring minds want to know. Let's see if we get any answers. Now, does that mean that the Christian believes that he's going to get into heaven by living for him who died for him and rose again? Of course not. Paul continues, look at Romans 6.3. Or do you not know that, is, that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death? Therefore, we have been buried with him through baptism into death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. What? Now, here we go. He's going to turn this into practical situations, and I'm going to argue for a positional understanding. In Christ... In Christ, listen to me, in Christ, I have died to sin. In Christ, I have been buried. I have been resurrected in Christ. And in Christ, I walk newness of life. In fact, in Christ, I walk as he walked. Now, you can try to argue, well, no, 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 this is true practically. It can't be true practically because I'm not dead to sin practically. I'm very much alive to it because I have a sinful nature. Clearly, I should walk in newness of life, but practically we don't because we demonstrate constantly the reality of the old life is very much present. The old life never goes away until glorification. So this is speaking of my positional unity with Christ. 
in him. I'm immersed in him. It uses the word baptism. I'm immersed into him. He is in me. I am in him. We are unified. Positionally, I am in Christ. Everything that's true of Christ is true of me. I am righteous. I am holy. I am obedient. I'm without sin. In my position. What does baptism symbolize? What is it a sign and seal of? Our being united to Jesus Christ, our engrafting into him, our remission of sins, our regeneration by his spirit, our adoption and resurrection unto everlasting life. When we contemplate Jesus going to the cross, which we remember together in the Lord's Supper this morning, I want you to think about this. If you're a Christian, you died with him. Amen. Positionally. Obviously, I didn't die Practically, because one, I'm still alive. I mean, I can't, I can't let you hear my heart beat. So all I can do is slap my, I know that technically doesn't prove that I'm alive. Okay. But I'm talking, I'm breathing. Okay. You can't hear me. I need, I need, I need to be able to find a way I put the microphone right up to my chest and you can hear my heartbeat. I'm very much alive. So clearly I'm not dead. I'm not dead to sin. I'm very much alive to it. So you have to understand this, that this is referring to the positional reality of the believer, not the practical reality. The practical reality is we walk in sin in so many ways. And the practical reality, I'm very much alive to sin. You died with him. Paul said, I was crucified with Christ. You were united to him in his death. That's why Paul says, what are you talking about? How can we continue in sin so that grace may abound? How shall we who died with Christ live in sin any longer? It's impossible. See, and when he says it's impossible, now th- this is where he's got to put the cookies down on the lower shelf. It's impossible for us to live in sin. Now you've got to be, you've got to give me the most comprehensive definition of live in sin that's ever been given in the history of mankind. Because the minute someone supposedly is living in sin, you're saying they're not saved. So now you've already thrown out the imputed righteousness. If you live in sin, it's impossible. You can't be saved. Well, wait a minute. What does it mean to live in sin? Because once again, let me say what living in sin would mean to me in my mind. You are saved. I was saved as a teenager, right? Uh, 1980s. I don't remember which year specifically at this moment. I could figure it out. But in the 1980s, here it is, 2022. 2022. You know what's been true of my life ever since my salvation? Sin, 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 sin. Sometimes so-called, quote, unquote, big sins. Sometimes, quote, unquote, small sins. Sometimes sins of action, sometimes sins of omission. Sometimes it's been sins in the mind. Sometimes it's been sin in the heart. Sometimes it's because of lust. Sometimes it's because of of hatred and anger and bitterness and unforgiveness. I can go on and on and on and on. I have been sinning. I have been sinning since then. I've sinned today. I have sinned this after this morning, this afternoon. I've sinned this evening. I'm going to sin tonight. I'm going to sin tomorrow. I am going to sin. And if I continue to sin all the time, how can you tell me it's impossible for me to live in it because I'm living in it? So then what we try to do is play some sem- semantic game and go, no, 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 no. It means like no, one specific sin. All right. So wait a minute. So if, so that means I com- I commit a sin and then I never live in it again. So that means I stop doing it. Well, it means you could still do it. You just don't continually do it. But what about the other sins? Let me just give you one. Here's one, right? Jesus says or in the old Testament, it's re- it's recorded in the old and the new Testament. Be ye holy as God is holy. That That's a command. Now, if I don't fulfill the command, I'm in sin, right? Have you ever fulfilled it one day of your life? You have never fulfilled that ever practically. Now, positionally, I am as holy as God is holy. Not practically. So that means I'm in perpetual sin. So how can you say that? No, he means you won't live in sin practically. No, I won't live in sin any longer positionally. That's the only way to understand it. Because we all live in sin practically. 
And in fact, if you start walking around acting like you don't live in sin, then you're sinning because you're lying, all right? It's the reality. You may not live in the exact same sins you used to live in. You may live in some sins different than mine. Yours may be greater than mine. Yours may be less than mine. Yours may be less scandalous than mine. Mine mine may may be more scandalous than yours. But the one thing true of all of us is we are sinning all the time in some way, shape, or form. But he's saying it's impossible. It's impossible. And if you do it, you didn't get the imputed righteousness. Well, wait a minute. See, th- then I'm not saved by imputed righteousness. See, he's making the standard for my salvation is I cannot live in sin because it's impossible. And if I do, I'm not saved. So what's the basis of my salvation? Not living in sin. <laughs> Hey, let's say, no, 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 no. You're not saved by that, but it proves that you're saved. And here comes the double speak. Hey, I'm not saying that's what saves you, but I'm saying if you don't do it, you're not saved, meaning I have to do it in order to be saved. So at that point, the imputed righteousness has been thrown out of the equation. If you're a Christian, you died with Christ at the cross. You no longer live. Christ lives in you. And the life that you now live in the flesh, you live by faith in the Son of God who loved you and gave himself for you. Exactly. The life I live now in the flesh, I live by faith in Jesus Christ. So the life I live in by... The life I live in the flesh by faith is connected to me being in Christ Jesus. I'm living in the flesh, there's sin, but because of faith in Jesus Christ, my life is not judged based off its action. My life is judged based off Christ, who now basically becomes my life. He is everything. He is my righteousness. He is my morality. He is my obedience. He is, he is my love. He is, he is everything. The old you is dead. Old me is very much alive. Positionally, it is dead. If you say the old Jew is dead, I want you to think about this. If you, the way he's preaching this, the old Jew is dead. If the old Jew is dead, he just taught the eradication of the old nature. Because you cannot say the old Jew is dead, but the old nature still exists because the old nature was a part of the old me. So if the old me is dead, then the old nature is dead. Therefore, I do no longer have a sinful nature. Therefore, perfect Christians are not only possible, they're plausible. You can't, it's just double speak. The old Jew is dead. Well, I mean, you're still not going to be perfect. You're still going to sin and you still have an old nature. But hey, everything is new. Well, Well, I mean, not everything is new because you still have an old. Could Christians hear themselves? It's just never-ending contradictions. And if you can remember your life before Christ, aren't you glad that old person's dead? See? I thank thee, Lord, that I'm not like I used to be. I thank you, Lord, that I'm not like all these other sinners. These other sinners have the old nature. These other, old, these other sinners are still alive in their sin. But I thank you, Lord, that I'm not... I am godly. I am holy. I no longer sin. Now, he's not gone so far to say he no longer sins, but I mean, if the old nature is completely gone and the old person is completely gone, then where is sin coming from? Oh, and if you're sinning, isn't that a part of the old man? And it, and if if it's already gone, then why are we told to put off and put on? What are we putting off and put on if the old is already gone? More Christian doublespeak. The old is dead. The old is gone. But put off the old and put off. Well, what am I putting off? The old is gone. It's already been put off for me. So why am I going to put it off? Why does it tell me to mortify the flesh when the old is supposedly dead? More Christian doublespeak. Because the true believer has been united to Christ and he has died to sin with Christ at the cross and is united to Christ in his glorious resurrection, we will walk in newness of life. We will sin. (laughs) In Christ, I don't. 
Every single person that God justifies and accepts into heaven by faith alone in Christ alone is also freed from the tyrannical power of sin while yet in this life. See? There we go. We're supposedly freed from the tyrannical power of sin. In other words, sin is no longer in charge. We're freed from it. Okay. Well, if I'm free from it, then that means I never have to sin. Now, now here's the thing. Am I truly free? Am I truly free? Because if you say I'm free, if I am free, I can stop sinning. You can't, and this is more Christian doublespeak. You're free, but you can't be perfect. Then I'm not free. This, this is like going outside to a dog who's been chained to a tree. And he's got maybe, maybe, you know, three foot chain, four foot chain, five foot chain. He can't go very far. And you come along and you're like, watch this. And you put a 70 foot chain, a 70, a hundred foot chain. And the dog gets up and you throw something in. It takes off running. It's like, oh, I'm free. I'm free. I'm free. I can, oh, 10 feet, 20 feet, 30 feet, 40, 50, 60. Oh, he's getting his size, 70, 80. Now he's running as fast, 90, 100. And then all of a sudden the chain jerks and it pulls its neck and it flips over on the ground. He is not free. Christians sell it. We're free from the power of sin. We're free from the bondage of sin. We're free from the tyrannical reign of sin. But you can't actually be perfect and you're still going to sin. Then I am not free. You're free, but you're not free. You're saved by imputed righteousness, but you're really saved by what you do. Now, I mean, you're not saved by what you do, but if you don't do it, you're not saved. It's just double speak, double speak, double speak, double speak, contradiction after contradiction after contradiction until it literally becomes meaningless words, just throwing the garbage out. It's just a waste of absolute time. In Christ, in my position, I am free from sin because I can't sin because I'm in Christ. In Christ, I am dead. In Christ, everything you're saying is true. But in my life, the old nature is still inside of me. I'm still in this body that is corrupted by sin. I'm going to get sick. I'm going to get old. I'm going to die. I'm going to sin. I'm going to, I'm going to want to serve self, live for self. I'm going to seek pleasure before God. It's going to happen. No one's justifying it. No one's excusing it. It's the reality. And God's Holy Spirit will cause that person to begin a new life of obedience. As, as God said to the people of Israel through Ezekiel, I will cause you, I will cause you to walk in my statutes and keep my judgments. I See, now here we get, now we have supernatural power. Dun, dun, da, da. Now you've got the power of the Holy Spirit. And now, of course, he's quoting Ezekiel, which was about Israel. Anyone can read that and see it's about Israel. It does not even require a seminary degree to figure that out. It literally says, Israel, Israel, because you've done this, I'm going to do this for you. Not because it's about you, but because it's about my name. And I'm going to regather you. I'm going to save you. And you're going to be in the land. That's literally what the text says. And then I would know it's about you. So what he's claiming is now, not now when you get saved. See, that you get it saved by imputed righteousness, but dun, dun, da, da, you get power, you get ability, you get set free, you've got the power of the Holy Spirit, and you will obey. I mean, at this point, he just, he just as well say the old nature is gone and you can be perfect. At some point, though, I'm waiting for the but and the however. It's got to be coming. I will put a new heart within you and take away your heart of stone. But folks, that life of new obedience does not and will not, praise God, factor into our entrance into heaven in any way, shape, or form. Paul continues in Romans 6, 5 through 7. Look at the last verses here. For if we have become... Now, he still hasn't explained, is it perfect obedience? He hasn't even explained, how can I say that you've been set free, but you still sin? How can I say that the old is gone, but the old nature is still there? How can I say, he's not explained anything. It's just, you make one statement, then you make the opposite statement, and then you go back on the previous statement, and then you just keep going, and everyone sits in the pew going, amen, amen, 
Amen. Okay, it's almost time to leave. Everyone grab your Bibles. Let's go home and eat lunch and say, wow, that was a good sermon, Pastor. And it was just not mindless not contradiction and doublespeak. I am so tired of that. The reality is everyone still sins. The reality is everyone still has an old nature. The reality is no one is freed from sin if we keep sinning. The only way to say I'm free from it is to say that I don't have to ever sin again and I can be perfect. (sighs) Here we go. United with him in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. Now listen carefully to verse 6. This is critical. Knowing this, that our old self was crucified with him in order that our body of sin might be done away with so that we would no longer be slaves to sin. Now again, this can only be true positionally. Because to say I'm not a slave to sin would mean that I never have to sin again. So either you're saying I can be perfect or you're saying that I'm not really set free. For he who has died is freed from sin. Our old man, if we're Christians, our old man was crucified with Christ. And folks, what is our old self? Our old self is the person who was the willing slave of sin, loved sin, served sin with all readiness of heart and actions, and had no interest at all. Okay, he's very close. He's getting really, really close to saying the old nature is completely gone. He's getting really close. He's walking right up to that edge. The old man is gone. The old man is crucified. The old man is gone. Now, I believe the old man has gone positionally. But see, obviously something's going on practically because we're told literally to put off the old and put on. Why are we told to put off the old if the old is gone? Why are why in one sense are we told to put off if the old is already dead? What am I putting off? See, there's a difference between my position and my practice. Well, let's see. Let's see if he's going to, he, he needs to offer some kind of clarification because at this point, he's basically said, yeah, you're saved by an imputed righteousness and everyone accuse you being an antinomian, but anyone accusing us of an antinomian, let, let me make it very clear. Here's how we're really saved by what we do. No, no, no. We're not saved by what he keeps saying. We're not saved by any of this, but you've already, already made it very clear that if we don't do all of this, then we're not saved. Meaning it's required to be saved. <laughs> In repenting of our sin and loving God and following Christ, there is no such thing as a Christian who is still the slave of sin. The scripture here in Romans 6 says it's impossible. All right. Now, the minute you say I'm no longer a slave to sin, that means I can stop sinning. If I can't stop sinning and be perfect, I'm still a slave. Either I've been set free or I haven't. Or I'm set free in my position, but I'm very much a slave in practice. Our old man was crucified with him that we would not be slaves of sin. Well, your your gospel of getting into heaven without any consideration of works at all? That's going to lead people to sin. What's our answer to that? May it never be. How shall we who died to sin live in it any longer? Our old man was crucified with Christ. Your answer is we don't sin. We stop sinning. We never sin anymore. Join our church where all the righteous people go. And we have been freed from sin's tyrannical power. God's answer, Paul's answer, And our answer to the charge of antinomianism, the charge that if we get into heaven without any consideration of our works at all, that is antinomianism. And you're saying people can sin all they want and still go to heaven. Our answer is this. God always does a radical change in the heart of every person he saves. He figuratively, that's spoken of as a figure of speech, removes their cold, dead heart of stone and replaces it with a living, beating heart that has God-given desires No, you just quoted from Ezekiel. 
which is for Israel. I, I don't know why that's so complicated to say that, but okay. To walk in newness of life, to put sin to death, and to pursue holiness. Not in order to become finally saved, because that would destroy our motive for even doing good works, but because there is now love in that heart which was once ruled by rebellion and hate. In other words, it's impossible that a true Christian would desire in their innermost heart to sin so that grace may abound. And yet, it's impossible for a Christian to ever desire to sin that grace may abound. We could never do that. No, no, no. We're, we're too good to do that. We are too good. Didn't you know we're too good? I mean, basically, I mean, when you get saved, you don't need imputed righteousness anymore because, baby, you can do it. You can, you can accomplish it. You can just do everything. The old is dead. The old, I mean, literally he is called for the, he is basically taught the eradication of the old nature. Unless he pulls back at some point, he is taught for, he is taught the complete eradication of the old nature practically and that we can be without sin practically. I mean, that's what, I mean, that, that's the logical conclusion to everything he has said. Unless he pulls way back. And if he pulls way back, then he's falling right back into the trap of the Christian doublespeak that, I, that I'm so exhausted by. The tendency that we have seen again and again and again in church history as the gospel of free grace is assaulted again and again with the same objection. You're saying we can live like the devil and still get into heaven. The church's response to that consistently, sadly, has very often been to in some way, Make the sinner's works or the sinner's fruits of their faith the decisive factor in the final outcome of their salvation. What's bizarre is he doesn't realize he's doing the same thing. Oh, he's trying to, oh, he, oh, this is so maddening. What do you want to say? No, no, no. We're not saying you're saved by any of these works. None of these works have anything to do by, uh, about your salvation. But he has literally says that if you don't do this, you're not saved. You're not saved by it, but if you don't do it, you're not saved, which means it's required that this happens. Because if it doesn't happen, you're not saved. Meaning, I have to do this in order to be saved. Because at this point, you're not saying the imputed righteousness. You're saying, no, 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 you won't commit sin. You won't walk in sin. You've been set free from sin. You'll stop sinning. You'll love God. You'll follow the, the Sermon on the Mount. You're going to, to obey. And if you don't, then you were never saved. Meaning, I have to do it in order to be saved. It's circular reasoning. We are not saved by it, but you have to do to prove that you got it. And if you don't prove that you got it, then you were never saved. So you have to have it in order to get it. It's just a circle. Where does the imputed righteousness come in? See, in his system, going back to my math illustration, the teacher says, all right, someone has imputed all of their math scores to you. You're now, you've passed, you've got an A. And then someone stands up, wait, 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 wait. Are you sure it was imputed? Well, we've got to give them a test. And then they give me the test, but now I've been given supernatural ability to pass math test. So now I get an A and say, see, clearly you got the imputed one because you just passed the test. Well, why do I need the imputed one when now you've just given me the, uh, the ability to pass it? I don't need the imputed. Because I've been given the ability to obey. If once you've been given the ability to obey, you don't need the imputed. He's basically said, now you have the ability to keep the law. You now have the ob ability to do it. Then I don't need the imputed righteousness. If I don't, if I've not been given the ability, I need the imputed righteousness because I'm going to continue to fail math tests for the rest of my life. There's a contemporary of ours today who is saying and defending that very thing. Here's a quotation, quote, these works of faith, this obedience of faith, these fruits of the spirit that come by faith are necessary for our final salvation. No holiness, no heaven. And in a roundabout way, you're saying the same thing. No fruits, no holiness, no walking in and uh, walking in holiness, no, uh, no living for God. All of the things he has said, if you don't do that, no heaven. You've said the same thing. All you're doing is just changing the phrase. You're just playing a little word game. No, 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 no. You were not saved by it. But if you don't have it, you're not saved. So it's required to prove it. But it's not required to get it. But if I don't prove it, then you don't have it. But you're saved by an imputed righteousness. 
But I'm going to, I know you get the imputed righteousness because of the practical righteousness. But how can you test imputed with practical? So we should not speak of getting to heaven by faith alone in the same way we are justified by faith alone. And folks, if you don't speak of getting to heaven by faith alone in the same way that you speak of being justified by faith alone, you don't understand Christianity at all. How, still quoting, how do you get into heaven? You don't get into heaven by faith alone. You get justified by faith alone. You get into a position where God is 100% for you by faith alone. And in order to get into heaven, that faith must bear the fruit of love. Pursue the holiness without which you will not see the Lord. Put to death the deeds of the body and you will live. We should not speak of getting into heaven at the last day through the last judgment When all of our lives are assessed for whether there's been any transformation confirming the reality of the faith which alone justifies. Now he's quoting this this final salvation kind of idea. I think he's quoting Piper there. I think he's quoting John Piper. And he's obviously very upset with John Piper. You know what? I completely agree with him. John Piper's position is heretical. It's ungodly. And it should be rejected by everyone. I think he, I'm almost positive that's John Piper. I'm almost positive because John Piper, there's been lots of controversy with his teachings on this. And it's insane. But what he doesn't realize, he's saying the same thing Piper is saying. What he is saying is, look, you're saved by an imputed righteousness. Wait, wait for it, though. But if you really are, you will do this, 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 this. If you don't do it, you never had it. So you have to do it in order to to, to prove that you've got it. Piper is saying, when you get to the end of your life, you've got to have the works to prove it. Because if you don't prove it, you don't have it. It's the same thing. He just changed the wording a little bit. Hey, we, we're not saved by works, but if we're saved, we'll have the works. And if we don't have enough works, then we were never saved. So you have to have the works in order to be saved. But just remember, you're saved by an imputed righteousness. No, if I'm saved by imputed righteousness, I have all the works. I have all the works of Christ imputed to me. So I always have the works because they're imputed to me. We should not say you can live like the devil and still get into heaven, end quote. Have we heard that before in church history? Those are the words of John Piper. Told you it was John Piper. Told you. And John Piper's final salvation thing is it's heretical. I'm sorry. It's not Christian. It's, it's, it's basically, it's a form of Roman Catholicism. I'm telling you, the evangelical world has become more Catholic than Catholics when it comes to soteriology. And, and I will stand by that. The, the Catholic Church won. The Reformation is over. The Reformation lost. Catholicism won. We may not have a pope. We may not have the robes, the incense, and the mass, and we may not have transubstantiation, we may not have purgatory, and we may not have the Miriam dogmas, but I guarantee you, we've got the same soteriology that basically is a workspace salvation, and I'm sick and tired of the uh, evangelical world pretending otherwise. You're Catholics, just admit it. The saddest part of those comments are these, you don't get into heaven by faith alone, you get justified by faith alone. I don't think two sentences could communicate a more fundamental misunderstanding of what justification is than those two. But he doesn't see that he's done the same thing. You are justified by faith alone, by an imputed righteousness. But, but, but if you don't do, if you, if you don't do all of these things, if you don't now live your life for God, love God, serve God. If you don't do all of these things, you're not saved because a Christian can no longer live in sin. A Christian can no longer serve self. A Christian can no longer do these things. It is impossible. So if you do it, you're not saved. Once again, he's thrown out the imputed righteousness and what's going to determine my salvation? Well, obviously the presence of these things, these works, these good things, the absence of sin, the eradication of the old nature. Uh, that, that, that all, I'm dead to sin. He himself has done the same. He's walked into the same trap. Justification is by faith alone because you do get into heaven by faith alone. And if you think you get into heaven by something other than Christ alone, you're lost. I'm not saying, well, you, you, your theology needs to be tweaked. No, you're not a Christian. 
Now, is that me being rigid? Is that me being harsh or unloving? No, I'm just going along. Well, by your standard, then you're not going to heaven because you've already told me that if I'm living in sin and then if I'm not, if the old nature is still there, if the old man is still there, and if I'm walking in sin in any way, shape or form, then I'm not going to heaven. You've told me that I'm saved not by imputed righteousness, but by these things, even though you've worded it differently, saying, no, 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 you're not saved by them, but they prove that you're saved. And if I don't have them, then I'm not saved, meaning they're required. You're doing the same thing. Along with Paul's insistence that there is only one gospel that can save sinners, to add anything at all to it as decisive in any way, shape, or form other than faith as the sole instrumental cause of our getting into heaven is to sever you from Christ. Christ will be of no benefit to you, and you are a debtor to keep the whole law. That is what the Apostle Paul taught us, and whether anyone esteems that as true or not, And I do love that. See, the minute you bring in works, you're responsible of keeping the whole law. I I completely agree. So guess what? If I'm going to look to works to prove that I'm saved, I have to keep the whole law to prove that I'm saved. I can't do that. So no amount of works could ever prove that I'm saved but I can tell you how I can prove that I'm saved because Christ did keep the entire law for me and his obedience is imputed to my account. The proof of my salvation is Jesus Christ, not what I attempt to do because no matter what you tell me I'm supposed to do, unless you live in denial, you don't live for self all the time. The old man is not gone. Sin still is very much in your body. You're not free from it because the reason I know you're not free from sin is because you can't be perfect, meaning that we're still walking in sin. It is still true. Piper says, so we should not speak of getting into heaven by faith alone in the same way we are justified by faith alone. How much clearer can someone be? I'm being slandered on the internet now. I've been having a lot of fun the last month. (laughs) People are saying I'm misrepresenting him. You're misrepresenting Piper. Really? No, and I, and look, him and I, just remember, I know I'm having some serious disagreements here. But let me make it very clear. His first 18 minutes, I am perfect agreement with everything he said, other than he accused other people who disagree for not reading their Bibles. I think that's unfair. And if he's being slandered for his stance against Piper, that's unfortunate because I agree with his stance on Piper. I completely agree that Piper is, it's heretical. It's completely ungodly. I completely agree with that. Where my issue is, in a roundabout way, he's walked into the exact same trap. He's saying the exact same thing just in a slightly different way. You're saved by an imputed righteousness. There are no works. But if you don't do this, 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 and this, you are never saved. Well, that means those works are required in order to be saved. And I've got to prove my salvation, not based off imputed righteousness, but by unpractical righteousness. And then you've made claims that we can do something that clearly we can't do. You've claimed that we're free when clearly we're not free because we continue to sin. To quote every word the guy has said on it in its own context, to play his entire sermons, his entire clarification videos, unedited, is somehow misrepresenting him. Well, evidently the guy can't be wrong, I guess, in the minds of some. When the scriptures teach us that justification is by faith apart from works, that is a shorthand way of saying that justification is by the shed blood and the imputed righteousness of Christ alone. And our justification is alone what gains us entrance into heaven. Amen. I completely agree. The blood of Christ and imputed righteousness is what gets me into heaven. And any test to prove that I got that would have to be a test of the righteousness that was imputed, not the righteousness that's manifested in my life in some way, shape, or form. Because whatever righteousness supposedly is going to be manifest in my life will always be incomplete and always be insufficient to meet the high standard of God, which is perfection. Think about it. God is the judge. We are in the dock. When we're summoned forth on the day of judgment, why does Paul say in Romans 8.33, who will bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is he that condemns? That is talking about our final verdict on the last day. 
For John Piper to teach that justification is actually not what gets us past the judgment, but rather that inherent righteousness that we have, which confirms the reality of our faith, is what gets us into heaven, is a false gospel, plain and simple. I agree, but in a roundabout way, you've done the same thing. What confirms that I'm saved? Well, now that I'm a Christian, supposedly, I no longer live for self. The old man is completely dead. I no longer live in sin. I walk in complete obedience. I'm completely dead to sin. And and I can do this, do this. The tyrannical reign of sin is gone. I'm completely free. I can do this. I can do this. I can do this. And if I don't do it, I then it is impossible for me to be saved. You've already made that clear that it's impossible for a Christian to live in sin. It's impossible for a Christian to not have the eradication of the old man. You've made that basically clear. So you've made it the same thing in a roundabout way that what confirms what conform what well what confirms to anyone that I'm saved my conformity to basically these rules and these laws and these actions which supposedly proves that I'm saved. It's, it's in a roundabout way. You've just, you've, you've, you've said the same thing. You've just changed up the order a little bit. But then here's the part I think many have missed, but which is a dead giveaway to what is really going on here. Did you catch what Piper said at the end of that paragraph I quoted in its entirety? We should not say you can live like the devil and still get into heaven. You know what he's doing there? John Piper believes that if we teach that we get into heaven by faith alone, we're saying we can sin so that grace may increase. So here you have a man who identifies himself as reformed, who agrees with Paul's enemies that to teach a full and free justification by faith with no works and that alone gets you into heaven, you're saying, you're saying that people can live like the devil and still get into heaven. And therefore, that same objection, sadly, That man takes his place with the Pelagians, with Rome, with the East, the Socinians, the Arminians, the Finneites, and the Wesleyans, and indeed, Paul's enemies. Romans 6, 1 and 2, listen to it again. What shall we say then to justification by faith alone, getting into heaven by faith alone? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Shall we live like the devil and still think we can get into heaven? Certainly not. How shall we who died to sin live in it any longer? John Piper's answer to this is clear. Hinge final salvation on the presence of works of love and obedience, which confirm the reality of the faith, which justifies us, but which does not get us into heaven. What's his answer? Hinge the final outcome on works. What's Paul's answer? Regeneration. God makes us alive in Christ. He gives us a new heart. He changes us radically. And so your answer is regeneration. So that how, how do we know we're saved? We do all these works. You're you're mad that Piper makes that the requirement to get into heaven and the final judgment. But you're saying, if I don't have all of these works, then I was never saved. It's the same game. Man. And you keep using regeneration, borrowing Ezekiel, which is the regeneration of Israel. It's driving me crazy. How do you get into heaven? Piper asks. You don't get into heaven by faith alone. What would Paul say to that? Hey, Paul, how can I get to heaven? By faith alone and Christ alone. So so I can live like the devil and still get to heaven? May it never be. How shall we who died to sin live any, any longer? Notice how Paul doesn't answer the objection. He doesn't say, well, let's find a way to make works fit in here somewhere. He doesn't do that. He lets the gospel still be the gospel. When Piper makes the very objection that Paul answers... The Pelagians, the Roman Catholics, the Eastern Orthodox, the Socinians, Arminians, Finneites, Wesleyans, and all the rest of them, they all jump up and shout amen against the charge of antinomianism that the freeness of entering heaven by faith alone in Christ alone leads to a sinful and licentious life. Piper's answer is very clear. He says, quote, such faith always works by love and produces the obedience of faith, and that obedience, imperfect as it is till the day we die, is not the basis of justification, but a necessary evidence and fruit of justification. In this sense, love... Oh, okay, wait, wait a minute, wait a minute. You, did you hear he throw it in? Okay, what, what's going to prove it? 
obedience, even though it's imperfect. So immediately, somehow my imperfect obedience. So that means if it's imperfect, I'm not free from sin. He's now, he just roundabout backed into it and now just acknowledged that it's not going to be perfect. Then I'm not free. If I cannot have perfect obedience, then the old man is not dead. I'm not dead to sin and I'm not free from it. You can't tell everyone the old, the old man is gone. You're completely new and that you're free from sin yet then turn around and say your obedience will not be perfect. What's causing it not to be perfect? The old man is gone. I'm dead. What's causing it? I'm free from sin. So why am I sinning? Why is my obedience not perfect? He just literally walked right back into it. Oh man, alive. Christian doublespeak is maddening. Works by love and produces the obedience of faith. And that obedience, imperfect as it is till the day we die, is not the basis of justification, but a necessary evidence and fruit of justification. In this sense, love. See, it's not the basis for justification, but it's the evidence. So what's the evidence of my imputed righteousness? Supposedly practical righteousness. What kind of evidence? Well, an imperfect obedience. Well, wait, how can an imperfect obedience prove Imputed righteousness, considering the imputed righteousness, is perfect. In practi- in incomplete obedience, right? Imperfect obedience can't prove imputed righteousness because the righteousness imputed is perfect. Of an obedience, inherent righteousness is required of believers, but not for justification. That is required for heaven, not for entering a right standing with God. <laughs> Folks, your right standing with God is what gets you into heaven. You see the error there? So many people say, yeah, but he saw it. He saw it on justification. He saw it on justification. Okay, wait a minute. So is he quoting Piper? See, if he's quoting Piper, he has literally said the exact same concept. I've got to back all this all the way up. All right. Because he, because he, unless he's saying, well, you have perfect obedience, I, I don't know. Now, now, now this is getting whacked out confused. I'm going to go all the way back to 40 minutes. Notice how Paul doesn't answer the objection. He doesn't say, well, let's find a way to make works fit in here somewhere. He doesn't do that. He lets the gospel still be the gospel. When Piper makes the very objection that Paul answers, the Pelagians, the Roman Catholics, the Eastern Orthodox, the Socinians, Arminians, Finneites, Wesleyans, and all the rest of them, They all jump up and shout amen against the charge of antinomianism that the freeness of entering heaven by faith alone in Christ alone leads to a sinful and licentious life. Piper's answer is very clear. He says, quote, such faith always works by love and produces the obedience of faith. And that obedience, imperfect as it is till the day we die, is not the basis of justification, but a necessary evidence and fruit of justification. In this sense, love and obedience inherent righteousness is required of believers, but not for justification. That is required for heaven, not for entering a right standing with God. (laughs) Okay, so he's quoting Piper. He's quoting Piper. So my question is for him, see, Piper is basically saying, you got to have this obedience. You got to have this to get into heaven. But he himself has said, I've got to do these things because if I don't, I'm not saved. But he wants to continue to say, but, but you don't do it to, to get saved. If you, you can say all day you don't do it to get saved, but if you don't do it, you're not saved, means I have to do it in order to be saved. So which is it? And at least Piper admits the obedience won't be perfect. So far, this, this individual has not even bothered to tell me whether, because he, this individual has seemed to make it clear that we won't sin at all. The old man is gone. We are supposedly completely free from sin, and we're supposedly dead. But I, so, so does he believe we can be sinless and, and Piper believes that we're going to continue to sin? I don't know, but they're both in a roundabout way saying the same thing. It's weird hearing someone argue against a position, but basically teaching a modified version of the same position. Folks, your right standing with God is what gets you into heaven. You see the error there? So many people say, yeah, but he saw it. He saw it on justification. He saw it on justification. He gets justification right. He gets justification right. And my answer to that is, yeah, but he's redefined what it accomplishes because it doesn't get you into heaven. And that's what the whole Reformation was about. That's what Paul's gospel is all about. Your justification is what gets you into heaven. 
Right. And if my justification is what gets me into heaven, it's based off imputed righteousness. So therefore you can't say I got to do this and this and this to prove that I have the imputed righteousness because the imputed righteousness is what gets me into heaven, not the proof of practical righteousness. And practical righteousness cannot be proof of imputed righteousness because imputed righteousness doesn't actually change anyone. He also says, quote, in final salvation at the last judgment, faith is confirmed by the sanctifying fruit it has borne, and we are saved through that fruit. If Piper's thinking we're justified by faith alone, but finally saved through the fruits of our faith, namely by our good works. And according to Piper, if we don't say that, if we don't say that, then we're antinomians. If we don't put it that way, then we're telling people, you can live like the devil and still get into heaven. Folks, that is not the biblical answer. In fact, it is the answer of the Judaizing legalists of the Galatian churches that Paul pronounced the anathema of God upon. The answer to the charge, you guys are antinomian. You're saying that people can live however they want and still go to to heaven. The answer to the charge is the biblical truth of regeneration and effectual calling. But God changes us objectively. God makes us alive in Christ. The old man is crucified with Christ. How shall we who died to sin live in it any longer? The basis upon upon which we get into heaven is the same basis upon which we are justified, folks. The shed blood and the righteousness of Christ alone. See, but you see the game he's playing? How do you get into heaven? Imputed righteousness, faith alone. Jesus did it. However, 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 if that really happens... You'll know it because you've been regenerated. And according to him, regeneration means the old man is completely dead. You're completely dead to sin. You're completely free from sin. So now you're going to live basically a sinless life. Now, if you don't have that, then you're not saved. Meaning I've got to do these things in order to be saved. And I don't know how I can be. The old man can be completely dead. I can be completely dead. I'm completely free from sin, but I've got all these other scriptures that say, put off, put on, mortify, do this, do that. I don't know how that supposedly works. Or maybe there's a difference between our positional standing and the practical reality. The practical reality, the old, the sinful nature is still there. I'm still a sinner. I'm still in bondage to sin and I'm going to struggle and I'm going to sin my whole life, but I'm saved by an imputed righteousness. Practically, I am dead to sin. Pra- or I'm sorry, positionally, I am dead to sin. I am a new creature, and the old is completely gone. P- positionally, practically, I'm still a sinner. The old man is very much alive. Justification is by faith alone. Because of this, getting into heaven is also by faith alone. The judgment at the last day is not going to include an assessment of our lives to see if there has been enough fruit to confirm the reality of our faith such that we can then and only then be finally saved and get into heaven. And here's the biggest problem. I say, well, I think it's funny. Hey, at the final judgment, there's not going to be a look at your works to confirm uh, whether you're saved. But you're saying the confirmation happens now in this life. And if I don't, if I, if I'm living in sin, I confirm that I'm not saved because that's impossible for me to do because supposedly now I've been set free from all of it. So you've just moved the confirmation from the last judgment to now. And I don't know who makes that determination. I guess he does. I don't know who does. Here's the biggest problem, folks. Please hear me. What happened at the cross? When you think about your Lord Jesus Christ, and I know you all love him. and I know you're all thankful for him. And everything he did, when you think about him going to the cross and carrying that cross up that hill and the scourging and the, the mockery and being beaten with reeds and the crown of thorns and the spear in his side and, and the agony that he endured. When you think about him, what do you think about? Folks, that is the final judgment. That is the fullness and the totality of God's wrath against all of our sins. It's all gone. Exactly. It's all gone. It's all gone. It's all been paid for. It's all gone. But what you're saying, it's all gone. But, 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 if you find yourself living in it, if you find yourself doing this or this and this and this, clearly you're not saved because if you were saved, you would be dead to sin. Uh, you would be free from sin and you would never, you won't live in sin because it's impossible for you to do so. That would have nothing to do with whether I'm saved because I'm saved. All of my sins have been paid for and the righteousness of Christ has been imputed to me. You're still trying to connect what we do or don't do to salvation. Because of what Jesus did. Paul says in Romans 5, 6, 
For when we were still without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet perhaps for a good man someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us, and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Now listen, how much more then, having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. When Paul speaks of being saved from wrath through him, what is Paul talking about? The horrors that our Lord endured in our behalf at the cross are, the the things he endured at the cross are in themselves what save us from the avenging wrath of God against our sins. That is the only thing that can save us from the final judgment. And folks, our works, even as Christians, can no more play a part in saving us from God's wrath than a spider's web has of stopping a million tons of boulders in an avalanche. I completely agree. Our works can do nothing to save us, and our works can do nothing to prove that we're saved because they can't prove the perfect imputed righteousness because our works are imperfect and we continue to sin and we have an old nature that corrupts even our good works. What saves us from the righteous and just wrath of God against us is Christ alone at the cross. Jesus' shed blood and his righteousness, which are given to us as pure and free gifts by faith alone, by belief alone, apart from works, apart from deeds of righteousness, apart from the obedience of faith, apart from works of law, apart from anything at all that we do before or after we are converted, that is what saves us from God's judgment at the last day. And that is the only thing that saves us from judgment at the last day. I just want to point out, God help us. God help us if we are in any way dependent upon God's assessment of the fruits of our faith in order to be finally saved Will Christians continue in sin that grace may abound? May it never be. Certainly not. How shall we who died to sin live in it any longer? Paul says, do you not know? It's like, it's like Paul is saying that to everyone that's ever denied it. Do you not know that your old self was crucified with him? That the body of sin might be done away with? That you would no longer be a slave of sin? It would never enter Paul's vocabulary to say, well, justification is by faith alone, but then final salvation is through your works. The man would never say that. He excoriated that in the most unmerciful terms in Galatians. Our old self was crucified with Christ in order that the body of sin would be done away with, that we would no longer be the slaves of sin. If you're a Christian, you are not a slave of sin any longer. See, now he goes right back to that. You're right. I'm no longer a slave to sin positionally. I'm no longer a slave to sin. And the fact that sin cannot keep me out of heaven. Sin cannot put me back under the wrath of God. I have been set free from sin in that way positionally. But practically, if I'm not a slave to sin practically, positionally, I'm not. But if I'm not a a slave to sin practically, then I can be sinless. The answer to the charge that salvation and getting into heaven by faith alone leads us to think that we can live like the devil and still get into heaven is the wondrous biblical truth of the new birth, the death of the old man, and that God changes us and gives us desires and causes us to walk in his ways. So once again, he, he's basically saying the old man is completely eradicated. We're com- the old is gone and now we do everything right. And he's yet to say that we don't do it perfectly. He quoted Piper, who says we don't do perfectly. He's basically saying we can do everything perfectly. So I don't even know why I needed the imputed righteousness. Not to hinge our final salvation on some kind of fruit inspection. When my father became a Christian, he wrote a beautiful song on his acoustic guitar that he used to sing all the time. I, I grew up in my house falling asleep at night listening to him sing it. It's called A Heart of Stone. And I want to close with the chorus because it's just perfectly true and biblical. My father said the, the, in his song, and I can hear him singing it, I would lay on my bedroom and fall asleep to this. What a joy for me to be able to hear my father sing the song about his own conversion before going to bed almost every night. But Jesus took my stony heart and threw it far away. He replaced it with a better one that grand and glorious day. 
The heart that he put into me was fashioned from his own. And now inside there's love instead of stone. Wow. So I guess his father didn't have a sinful nature. <laughs> I'm glad you have a father who no longer had a sinful heart. That's, 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 that's pretty stinking awesome. When people tell us that the gospel of getting into heaven by faith alone will lead to a licentious life or to willful sin so that grace may abound, our answer must not ever be to make final salvation, whatever in the world that means, depend on the fruits of our faith. Instead, we point to the reality that every true Christian who will get into heaven by faith alone will be saved by faith alone at the final day at the last judgment in Christ alone on the basis of his blood and his righteousness alone. Every person about whom that is true died to sin when they were converted. How shall they live? <laughs> he, 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 he's, he's, he's so like, you, we, it will not be based on final, our final judgment will not be based on any of this stuff. But hey, 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 if you're truly saved, you died to sin, you no longer live in it. But so if you didn't die to sin and you still live in it, then clearly you weren't saved. <laughs> so, so what confirms our salvation, maybe not at the final judgment, but what confirms it in his mind in the present is the old nature is gone and he's yet to even qualify it. He's not even qualified what it means that, that supposedly the old nature, I mean, he's literally basically told us the old nature is gone. We're completely set free from sin and we can no longer live in it. And now we're no longer live for self. And we do all, we basically, we're basically sinless. And, and if I'm not basically sinless, then I'm still in my sin. Therefore I wasn't converted. It's just, uh, it's just bizarre how he's like, Piper is wrong. And he's basically saying the same type of thing. Any longer. And as my dear father said, and now inside there's love instead of stone. There's inside there is sin. Inside there is love for self. Inside there is self-worship, self-exaltation, self-pleasure, self-desire, self-seeking. The answer to the charge of antinomianism. I hope you all remember that, that your children remember it, your grandchildren remember it, and that no one that is a descendant of this church will ever succumb to false teachers who do not know the biblical answer to that charge. Let's pray. Ba- and then he says, let's pray. That's the end. So here we, I can summarize his 48, minute, 48 minutes and 51 seconds of teaching this way, that we're saved by an imputed righteousness. Someone's going to accuse you of antinomianism. You know what you tell them? I'm not an antinomian because now that I'm saved, I can do it. I can keep the law. I can obey. I I am no longer a a slave to sin. I've been set free. The old nature is completely gone. I can do it. I have love inside of me. I have a new heart. I'm not an antinomian because I can keep it all. I can obey. I can do it all. Okay, well, I, okay, well, congratulations. You're not an antinomian because here's the thing. You don't, you no longer need the imputed righteousness of Christ because you now live without sin. Well, that's not the answer to antinomianism. The the, the answer to antinomianism is no, I can keep the law because now I've been given supernatural ability to do so. (laughs) No, because anyone who looks at your life will be like, you just failed right there. 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 He demonstrated arrogance, pride, and a judgmental spirit earlier in the sermon when he says that basically anyone who doesn't agree with him, it's because they don't read their Bibles. That's judging, and that's condemning, and that's arrogant. Well, that's a sin. Wait a minute. I thought you, the old man was dead. Where did that sin come from? Oh, I'm sorry. We don't call, I guess we don't call what we do sin anymore because the old nature is gone. It is ludicrous. It is deceptive, and it's crazy. I don't know why Christians can't acknowledge how much sin is in our lives every single day. We continually sin. We are very much alive to sin. The sin nature is still very much present in us. We fall short in thought, word, and deed every single day. I don't know what is it with the evangelical world who can't admit that. (sighs) Wow. All right. 
you can email me. News, if at yahoo.com. I don't even know what to say. Uh, I, I guess the dramatic conclusion of this kind of mini series on a- answering charges of antinomianism is oh, wow. That, that's, that's the dramatic conclusion. Email me, newsif at yahoo.com, newsif at yahoo.com, newsif at yahoo.com. There is a perfect example of Christian doublespeak, of just circular reasoning, and just a denial of absolute reality. And I'm baffled by it. Thanks for listening. God bless.